Okay, great. Uh, welcome everybody to the fall uh, relaunch of uh, discrete optimization talks. Uh, we are very happy to have uh, two distinguished speakers um, today. Uh, first off, uh, we have uh, Professor Thomas Sandholm of uh, Carnegie Mellon University Department of Computer Science. Um, Thomas is a, is a well-known researcher uh, working uh, at the intersection of uh, AI, uh, operations research, uh, and economics, uh, where he's, he's made multiple uh, significant contributions. Um, and uh, for his work, he's received many awards uh, of note are the, the Minsky Medal and the HKI uh, Computers and Thought Award. Uh, and today he's gonna tell us about uh, algorithm configuration uh, from practice to theory. So Thomas, please go ahead. Elias, thanks a lot for having me. Uh, how does the sound uh, seem? Everything sounds great. Uh, I just wanted to say that for questions, please write in the chat. Uh, we will take them after uh, Thomas finishes. And there will also be a breakout room at 2 o'clock for each of the speakers. So you can ask them questions in a more individual setting, like in, approaching the podium after a talk, um, or just to chat with us. So uh, stick around for that as well. And thank you, everybody, for coming. OK, thanks, Alex. So I'm going to talk about configuring algorithms automatically from practice to theory. And that's kind of a interesting last part of the title. And I'm going to start from a, a very practical side, how we use these things uh, for, for possibly the first industrial application of algorithm configuration. In, uh, we used it for combinatorial auctions. And in the second part, I'm going to talk about some new theory from the last three years. And um, on the, I'm picking up results from different papers and I'm gonna at the beginning of every segment at the bottom of the slide I'm gonna show which paper it is and with what co-authors but I'd like to hi highlight one co-author up front which is Ellen Vitochik who's a PhD student who is uh, going on the market this year. All right so the setting is tree search and many other algorithms and mechanisms. Uh, the presentation will focus mainly on mixed integer linear programs for concreteness but a lot of the results apply more broadly than that. This uh, mixed integer linear program, as you know, is to maximize c dot x subject to ax is equal to b, where some of the variables have to be integral. Uh, combinatorial auction winner determination is one example of an integer program. Uh, the traditional form of combinatorial auctions is just package bidding, but uh, it actually gets a lot richer than that in terms of uh, the models, and I'll talk about that. But just in the package bidding model, here's the MIP. Uh, it's to maximize the sum of the accepted bid values subject to the constraint that no item is sold more than once and subject to the constraint that for any bidder, not more than one of their bids is accepted, which enables full expressiveness of the bidding language and the bids have to be accepted all or nothing. When we get to the real um, uh, models, it's richer than this, but I just wanted to show you this for concreteness. And when I'm gonna get to some experiments in the second part of the talk, we'll be focusing on this simple vanilla variant. Also, facility location problems can be formulated as MIPS and our papers on, uh, in the second part also benchmark on those. Clustering problems as well. Um, I'll show some results on those. Uh, noisy binary classification problems can be formulated as MIPS and we'll benchmark on those as well later in the talk. So a branch and bound is the most widely used algorithm for combinatorial optimization and MIP solving in particular. Uh, you know about solvers like CPLEX, Urobi, ExpressMP, SKIP, and so on. And uh, CPLEX has a 221 page manual describing 135 parameters. And they say that you may need to experiment. And indeed, uh, the parameter settings make a huge difference in the algorithm's performance. Now, uh, let's talk about the uh, applied side first. So uh, from 2001 to 2010, we were running large scale combinatorial sourcing auctions. We conducted over 800 auctions, totaling over 60 billion. And these were the most expressive auctions ever conducted. We created 12.6% of implementable savings for the buy side, which would have been 15.4% unconstrained and the suppliers also benefited. So we call this expressive commerce because it's such a broad generalization of combinatorial auctions. It has two sides, expressive bidding by the bidders, which are the suppliers in the sourcing case, and expressive allocation evaluation by the buyer, 
uh, which is a bit thick. The expressive bidding can take on many forms, and here are uh, some of the forms that we uh, supported. So package bids of different forms, and not just the vanilla package where you say, okay, items two, three, and seven, $25. Rather, these can be also flexible packages that say, that, okay, I'll pay for this package at this price as long as items are in these ratios, or, or roughly in these ratios. So with one expression, you can actually express an exponential number of packages. Conditional discount offers of different forms with general trigger conditions, effects, combinations, and sequencing. Discount schedules of different forms. Side constraints, for example, capacity constraints. Multi-attribute bidding, where the bidders can actually express their items in alternative ways by changing the attributes on the items and detailed cost structures. A simple example of that uh, would be a fixed price plus a variable price, but uh, we had some items that had hundreds of cost drivers in them. On the expressive allocation evaluation side, we saw about 800 different classes of side constraints, and then we abstracted it into a few classes. Uh, counting constraints, cost constraints, unit constraints, mixture constraints, and so forth. There were also expressions of how to evaluate bidder and bid attributes. So how does the buyer value different vectors of attributes on those bids? It's actually interesting, typically in supply chain, at least at the time, the supply network would be designed first and then you would source to the network. Here, what we did is the opposite. We said that let's source to all possible supply networks, and then the winner determination as a side effect is going to configure the supply network as well, multiple levels deep. And here's a paper if you want to uh, read more about that. Now, for this audience, maybe the most interesting piece here, although there are other really interesting intellectual pieces as well, is the optimization problem which is the clearing problem or also known as the winner determination problem. This is what do you do uh, once you've gotten the bids? You allocate and define the business. So allocate decides who wins what items. Define means that we're also picking the items configuration. As I said, you know, items can come with multiple different attribute vectors and we have to decide which one. So as to minimize cost, adjusted for the buyer's quantitative preferences. So you might say, okay, favor incumbents by 3% and so on. Subject to satisfying all of the constraints. Now this problem, or even actually a simple subclass thereof, is NP complete and inapproximable, as we proved. Inapproximable in the worst case, of course. Uh, we solved problems that were about 100 times bigger than competitors at the time on all dimensions. Sometimes we had over 2.6 million bids in an auction, over 160,000 items, multiple units of each, over 300,000 side constraints, and over 1,000 suppliers, bidders. Our average time to clear the problem optimally was 20 seconds, the median was one second, and some instances took days. Now, the optimization technology is exploit structure of various types. It's a, based on a branch and cut framework, and we used commer the commercial general purpose MIP solvers of the time, but they weren't adequate as is for this problem as, and expressiveness. So we developed a host of other techniques on top of those development frameworks uh, to make this uh, scalable and robust. And we actually published many of these techniques in AI uh, and OR journals and conferences. So we didn't keep the, uh, all of them trade secret, we actually uh, contributed to the literature for directly from the company. All right, here are some of the techniques for enhancing speed. So search formulation first. What is the branch question family in the search tree? Branching on items, branching on bids, multivariate branching, combinations of those three. And then when we get beyond the vanilla combinatorial auction, there are other alternatives as well, like we were branched on discount triggers and so forth. Then branch question selection different strategies, and also picking the strategy itself dynamically in the tree separately for each search node. Node selection, detecting decompositions dynamically and upper and lower bounding across decomposed components. 
identifying and solving tractable cases uh, at nodes, even if only part of the remaining problem falls into a tractable class. Fast data structures, domain-specific pre-processing techniques, automated coefficient reduction, custom cutting plane families and cutting plane generation and selection techniques, and primal heuristics, solution seeding, and the information theoretic branching approach. Um, and But here for this talk, maybe the most relevant slide is this. So we were doing automated algorithm uh, configuration in the background all the time. So we had servers looking at previous instances of the winner determination problem and figuring out for what kind of instances do what kind of parameter configurations work best. We were selecting among 12 configurations. They were on two MIP development frameworks, CPLEX and ExpressMP, with our techniques on top. We had six configurations in each, selected manually based on what we had seen as making a difference on different instances. For example, cutting plane parameters, but not only algorithm parameters, but also modeling choices. So we were actually learning not just how the algorithm should be configured, but how the problem should be modeled. So for example, there are uh, two different types of counting constraint modeling uh, approaches we used that have selective superiority depending on the instance. And uh, we were uh, learning which of those formulations was better on a per instance basis. The configuration of the algorithm was selected on a per instance basis using about 50 handcrafted instance features, which would be computed off the instance as a new instance came in. And then we would, based on those, uh, decide which algorithm configuration to use. We had about 80,000 training instances. And you might think, how can that be if we had only 800 auctions? Well, it turns out that the average number of winner determinations per auctions was 109. And that's because the buyers would change their preferences and constraints and rerun the winner determination over and over. So that's how we got about 80,000 training instances. And then we used uh, standard decision tree software to select the best configuration based on those instance features. This on average improved speed 2x to 3x. Sometimes it would improve orders of magnitude and sometimes of course it would hurt. Uh, now, why was it only 2 or 3x? Why wouldn't we get 100x on average, for example? Well, we looked at that and said that, okay, maybe the decision tree doesn't pick up uh, the right kind of uh, hypothesis, but that wasn't it. We also did this type of an omniscient machine learning test where we said, that what if the decision tree actually were told which one was the best? Uh, how much... Uh, slower is our real thing compared to that omniscient benchmark and it was only 10 percent slower so uh what this says that the learning wasn't the problem uh, if you want bigger speed ups maybe we need more different configurations a richer configuration space to consider all right now let me move to part two of the talk this is um, a more theoretical part but it also has experimental results here, it's about many similar optimization problems that must be solved again, like in the first part. Uh, using this set of typical problem instances, we can provably learn a near optimal search parameter vector that works for previously unseen instances in the application. And this is the first uh, generalization guarantee for tree search and integer programming. And now the red letter A here means that we're a little different than in the first part. In the first part, we were trying to pick a configuration based on instance features. Here we're trying to pick a universally good configuration of the algorithm for our entire problem instance distribution at hand. And I'm going to come back to the first type of problem at the very end of this talk. And in this talk, I will mainly focus on learning near optimal branching rules but many of the results actually apply more broadly for controlling other aspects of uh, algorithms as well. Okay, so the model is that we have an application specific distribution of problem instances. So for each instance, we have the A matrix, the B and the C vector, and we get these uh, instances 
and an algorithm designer wants to come up with good branch and bound parameters. And by the way, I'm using branch and bound with the full understanding that it can be branch and cut. It can be some sort of richer framework as well. Um, and in the experiments, we in fact do that. This has traditionally been a manual endeavor and it makes a huge difference. We and two other groups, namely Eric Horvitz's group and Kevin Layton Brown's and Holger Hus's group, did early experimental work on automated search algorithm configuration starting around 2000, 2001. And it started in winner determination and combinatorial auctions, then in satisfiability, and then in integer programming. Now, all of that work was experimental, and there's been a lot more work on that in the last five years. Uh, and most of that work has also been experimental. Our ICML 18 paper that I'll talk about next was the first to also give generalization guarantees for search algorithm configuration. That means that we can guarantee that we are going to do well in a pack learning sense on previously unseen instances. Now, that is very similar to uh, a paper that appeared just before ours uh, by Gupta and Rothgarden, also using pack learning for algorithm configuration, but in simpler settings like, for example, greedy algorithm parameter setting. Now, there's been a lot of additional related research. I'm just mentioning some things here on this slide um, for integer programming, learning, learning in integer programming. And again, these papers are typically purely uh, empirical. And ours was the first to actually give generalization guarantees. And by the way, this list here is not complete. In, in uh, the literature just keeps growing and growing. And in the papers, we have a more elaborate related research section, of course, especially in the new version of the paper, the journal, uh, journal draft. All right. So the variable selection policy is one important aspect of uh, integer programming solvers, maybe uh, one of the two most important together with cutting planes. So here the question is, once we're in a, one we're, once we're in a search node, which variable should we branch on? Here, for example, we're branching on X7. This makes orders of magnitude difference in speed. And uh, I was really vexed as to whether I could generate a universally good variable selection uh, policy, maybe 15 years ago. But that turns out to be impossible. Liberatore showed that uh, checking whether even just at the root, a branching variable is better than too optimal, so it doesn't double the size of your remaining work, isn't possible unless p is equal to np. So we're going to have to learn on an instance distribution basis what a good policy for variable selection is. So we're going to uh, uh, talk about score-based variable selection policies, which is really not a restriction at all. It's more just putting a mathematical framework on it. So given a node Q in partial search tree T and a branching variable XI, there's a score that tells us how good it would be to branch on that variable XI. And of course, this can be used for multivariate branching as well. But here I'm going to uh, talk about single variate branching. OK, what we are doing here in most of the pa uh, paper, we are learning a good combination of existing branching rules. So we're not trying to make a branching rule from scratch, but we take D scoring rules and learn the best combination of them. For example, in the first part of the talk, I'm going to talk about convex combinations where I'm just additively putting weights on them. Now, first try would be discretization. And this is how this liter emp empirical work typically works. So you discretize a parameter space, find parameters in the discretized set with the best performance on samples. So for example, if we're trying to combine two uh, branching rules using a convex combination, there's one parameter mu that says how much to weight one, and the other one is weighted one minus mu. And uh, then the curve might look something like this. I'm trying different mu values on the training data, and I have the average tree size or whatever measure I want to use. Maybe it's tree size, or maybe it's some sort of solution quality in a different kind of algorithm, and I'm picking the one that has uh, the best value. Now, uh, that doesn't work. Uh, from a generalization perspective. And this is going to be our first uh, result. So it doesn't work even on finding a convex combination of just two standard branching rules. 
So let's say we're measuring strong branching bound improvement in the better child versus worse child. This is a classic problem. Penny Shortell and Beal suggested using mu is equal to zero, which is that you weight the worst child where the bound chains less 100% uh, and the better ch uh, child not at all. Uh, the idea is that the worst child has the bigger tree under it, so that's going to be the dominant factor. Uh, Gauthier and Riviere proposed half-half. Linderoth and Sadlsberg said, yeah, one third, kind of uh, taking a little bit of both, but more of the worse. Then Octoberg found that uh, one sixth worked best among uh, his uh, tested uh, values. Now, what I'm going to tell you is that none of those is the right answer. And in fact, there is no right answer. Uh, so there's, first of all, not a good value, but also if you have a fixed discretization of values that you are trying, that doesn't work. So uh, we have a theorem that says that for any discretization that's fixed, in other words, data independent, there is an infinite family of problems, problem instance distributions, where this problem happens, where we have the parameter on the x-axis and tree size on the y-axis, and there's a narrow sliver of parameter value where we get a tiny tree, constant size tree, and everywhere else the tree is exponential. And if you give me any discretization, I can actually make a MIP instance where that good range of the mu value does not fall on any of your discretized points. So how does it work? Well, we construct an uh, infeasible MIP with variables that are easy outs. And branch and bound takes exponential time unless it branches on one of those easy out variables. Um, and we construct the instance so that branch and bound only finds easy out variables if it uses the parameters from that narrow range, which doesn't fall on your discretization. Can we get around this? Yes. And here's the first lemma, and this is a very simple version, just to give you in intuition. Uh, this is for the setting where integer variables are constrained to be binary and the branching rule is depth wise, meaning that we, the branching rule can take information not just from the path from the root to the current node, but also from other paths up to that depth, but no deeper. So most branching rules are like this. Reliability branching, for example, is not like this, but we'll generalize this later. So here, we observe that the number of possible different trees that could happen is the number of variables to the power of variable squared. And the different intervals on this line of mu uh, have a constant tree. And there can therefore only be that many intervals that uh, uh, we need to consider. And then we get to the first theorem. Um, the algorithm is to find intervals of mu on the training data where the branch and brown tree is invariant across all samples and we return any mu from an interval that minimizes average cost over the samples. And then the first theorem is for the binary case where we let cost be a tree constant cost function that could be tree size but it can also be something like solution quality if you like and it's in the range zero to h and we let um, score, now this is going kind of, okay, let me move that out of the way. Um, these are, we're combining two scoring rules. Then uh, we have this back learning guarantee here that the performance on the real distribution is epsilon close to the performance on the training data. As long as we have theta h squared, variable squared, uh, number of training instances. And of course, we have the epsilon here and the delta here, as you would expect in back learning. And the proof is that the pseudo dimension is the log of the number of intervals, so it is just variable squared. And that's uh, the idea of the proof. Now, experiments, this is with Cplex, with callbacks, with all of the goodies kept on. So it's the real Cplex with pre-solved primal heuristics and cuts all on. Uh, we are, um, in the convex scoring rule case for strong branching, for different problem instance distributions, we see a very different type of curve. So there is no good value in practice either for the parameter. And we do need this type of learning. And for different problem instance distributions, the uh, curve looks very different, even qualitatively. Now, if we do the product scoring rule, same thing, again, different and different from the 
convex scoring rule. And if we do the product score, convex scoring rule for pseudo cost branching, it's yet different. So one can't really have typically good intuition as to how to set these parameters and one needs a solid technique to uh, set them. Now, additional results. Now, theory for combining debranching rules, which don't have to be depth-wise and not just for binary MIPS. Here we have the same type of result that our actual performance on the real distribution that we don't know is epsilon close to the performance on the training set. As long as the number of training examples is h squared again, epsilon squared here again, ln one over delta as before, but now we have an extra factor kappa, which is a maximum tree size allowed. So if h was the tree size allowed in the first place, now we have h cubed instead of h squared uh, that we had in the simpler setting. Now the proof here is a little more general, but the picture here on the right shows it. It's the idea that the parameter space is split into regions cut by hyperplanes, such that the same tree is getting generated in every region and there can't be too many regions. And then we can again take the log to get the pseudo dimension. We have the same theory also for the product combination family. And if the data is nice, we can use Rademacher complexity instead of pseudo dimension to get even tighter bounds in theory that are one to three orders of magnitude tighter. Now, uh, here's an even more general theorem where we can say that, okay, these hyperplanes that cut the space don't actually have to be lines. They can be any sort of curve that has small pseudo dimension. Let's call it CF. And the pieces therein don't have to have constant performance as long as they have performance that has small pseudo dimension. So some sort of simple function, that's okay. So we just get these two uh, pseudo dimensions summed and we have a similar type of general result. And we have applied this not just to MIP, but also to auction design, voting, redistribution, and computational biology. Now, uh, we can also combine this with frugal training, where we have an algorithm in a different paper that takes an infinite parameter space and makes a portfolio of uh, a finite number of parameter vectors that are guaranteed to still have this generalization guarantee. And then you can feed it into any configuration tool that assumes a finite parameter vector uh, space. And you can also approximate the performance surface with a small number of constant pieces if the approximation satisfies the L infinity norm, other norms do not suffice. And on integer programming, we obtain sample complexity bounds that are up to 700 times smaller using this approximation technique instead of trying to match all of the pieces exactly. So let me uh, stop there and we may have a couple of minutes for questions. Thank you very much, Thomas, uh, for the nice talk. Uh, I think in the interest of time, we'll, uh, if you have questions, please uh, join us at 2 p.m. Uh, after the second talk, where you can uh, ask Thomas some more questions in a, in a separate room uh, for a bit of time. Thanks again, Thomas. My pleasure, thank you. I'll be available then.